and uh, I suppose people will filter in, that's all right. Um, so this is a, I'm Grant Whitney, I'm the treasurer of the Georgetown University Board Gaming Society, um, and thanks for coming. This is Serious Games uh, Humanitarian User Research. So we're doing this in conjunction with um, McGill, uh, and so we've got two guests. We've got Matthew Stevens and Tom Fisher. Um, we're going to go into their uh, report that they gave back in January 2020 uh, for Save the Children uh, the UK. I don't want to uh, completely undersell you guys, so I'll let you guys do your own introductions, but just kind of a brief uh, how we do this. Um, so Tom and Matthew will uh, uh, do their presentation. If you have any, any questions, uh, feel free to toss them in the chat. Um, and uh, if it's something particularly uh, pertinent that Tom or Matt want to look into, they'll bring it up. Otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll plan on doing all the questions at the end. Um, so I'll, I'll keep an eye on, on what questions people have. Um, and so we'll open it up to a Q&A at the end. Um, but uh, yeah, and, and just, uh, we, we do ask that people, and it looks like everyone's uh, doing good for this so far, but uh, just turn off your mic and camera, just reduces the bandwidth and then reduces um, background sounds. So um, with that, I'll, uh, I'll let Matt and Tom take it away, guys. Fantastic, fantastic. Um... So I'll just start by saying thanks to Grant uh, for that excellent introduction. Um, and also, uh, of course, to Sebastian for, for the work that he does on this as well. Um, and thanks to the entire Georgetown University Wargaming Society for putting this on. Um, it's a fantastic webinar series and we're very fortunate to, to be invited to be a part of it. Um, hopefully they don't regret having us out, but uh, I'm sure we'll do okay. Um, I'd like to welcome all the participants. Thanks for joining us. Um, today's the day the NHL comes back, no less. So it's, it's uh, you know, it's a, it's a big day for you to be sacrificing your time. Um, my name is Matthew Stevens. Uh, this is Tom Fisher here with me. Um, I also have to apologize for the dismal state of my office. We're in the process of moving here. So it doesn't always look this draft, I promise. But uh, today we're going to be talking about the application of serious gaming to humanitarian contexts, and in particular teaching and learning. Um, we'll give a, an overview of a research project that was sponsored by Save the Children UK and carried out by Tom and myself uh, on the potential of serious games as learning tools in the humanitarian sector, um, particularly in the context of training local uh, humanitarian actors. So we'll briefly go over what we learned carrying, about, carrying out uh, games-based learning workshops in Jordan and Kenya in early 2020. Um, we'll discuss the use of games-based learning for humanitarian work um, and explore some of the findings from that, that work. Um, we'll share a bit about the distinctions we found between digital and classroom-based games, a topic which has unexpectedly become more relevant um, this year, um, not so much when the research was carried out. Um, we're also going to, to give a very high-level overview of some best practices for humanitarian game design, including how it can differ, differ from a traditional war game. Now, what you're not going to get today is an in-depth nuts and bolts description of how to build a learning game. Um, for that, uh, please do read the full report. Uh, feel free to reach out to Tom or I or any of the other very experienced people on this chat if you have any further questions or would like to access further resources. Um, we are very passionate about this work. We love hearing from people, so really don't hesitate to drop us an email. Uh, could we pop to the next slide there, Tom? So the first thing I'd like to do is give a big thank you to our research team. Um, I don't think anyone is on the call today, but possibly. Uh, if you are, say hi in the chat, get your accolades. Um, in addition to myself and Tom, we couldn't have finished this work without uh, Joanna from LLST uh, and Brianna, Catherine, Sterling, and Alejandra uh, with Imaginetic. I and mean, we also owe a huge thanks to the Save the Children humanitarian, humanitarian Capacity Building team, uh, their East Africa Regional Office and the Middle East Regional Office for making all of this happen. We certainly uh, would not have had a very exciting report without all of those people. Uh, we can pop to the next slide. So I'll introduce myself very quickly. Um, my name is Matthew Stevens. I'm based in Canada. Um, and I've been in the humanitarian development sphere for over a decade now, which is a bit scary to say out loud. Um, my experience has primarily been working with refugees and migrants. So I've lived and worked in contexts uh, from the Peruvian Amazon through to, to Vietnam. Uh, but most of my recent experience has been in the Middle East, where I served as a project director and the country director uh, of the Jordan Office of a medium-sized international humanitarian organization. 
I've been passionate about the potential of applying learning games to humanitarian training since taking part in uh, one of Professor Rex Bryant's simulations in 2013. Um, so when I returned to Canada in 2017, uh, I decided to do something about it. Uh, the next year I started Lessons and Learn, Simulations and Training, with the goal of producing better prepared, more aware, and more empathetic humanitarian workers through the power of serious games. Now we're still a fairly young organization. Um, in our first year we delivered three full courses, four standalone simulations and various one-day workshops to over 100 humanitarian workers, government staff, journalists, academics, uh, private refugee sponsors, and to the public. Um, now in 2020, we're increasingly, increasingly working directly with humanitarian organizations to meet their training needs. Um, and of course, uh, my partner in crime on this project was the venerable Tom Fisher of Imaginetic, who I'll pass over to for a moment here. Th thanks for calling me venerable. I don't know if that means just because I'm all that old or uh, deserving in that respect. Um, throwing up a bit of info here. Uh, I'm the president of Imaginetic, based in Canada, out of Montreal specifically, but operating worldwide. Uh, there's a QR code there with my contact info if anyone wants to take a quick snapshot of that. Rather than get into too many details in terms of all my experience, I will just gloss over because there's something important that I would like to discuss. Uh, I started getting into educational gaming in 2005 in special ed education and transitioned into serious gaming and working at the World Bank through uh, around about 2010 when uh, I was introduced to people from the World Bank by Rex Brynan. So uh, yes, it's not just what you know, it is who you know uh, that will open doors for you tremendously. Uh, and since then have uh, collaborated on a number of projects uh, all throughout uh, at McGill, other universities, University of Maryland. And as we are talking about education, uh, not too long ago, I think it's uh, about a month ago, uh, Rex Bryan and uh, some of his uh, Motley crew uh, put together a statement on the Derby House principles of inclusion and diversity in gaming. As we discovered that as we go to Connections, Connections North, Connections UK, that there is a preponderance of the old white men and we have the old white man syndrome. And so a group of uh, talented wargaming professionals put together these principles of inclusion and diversity. Uh, I know Matt has uh, signed on in full support. I've signed on in support. I know the uh, Georgetown University Wargaming Society has as well. What I'm doing, and especially because there are students online here, Imaginetic is offering a bursary and which will be awarded next January. The, there's a September 30th deadline. So anyone who knows students who are, uh, shall we say, of the not typically represented groups uh, in Wargaming, then please invite them to uh, go to the website and fill out an application because the more diverse voices that we have, the better the community will become. This has been proven in research as well as uh, just our own anecdotal views. And so we are doing all we can to try to support that. So please, uh, if you want to take a snapshot of this, uh, direct people to, uh, to apply and uh, hopefully someone you will know will uh, be awarded the bursary. And with that, I shall hand things back to Matt for our goals in this research. Hey, Matt, you're muted. I was just congratulating Tom on what, uh, what a fantastic opportunity he's, uh, he's set up there. So yeah, all right, let's dive in. Thanks for letting me know there, Grant. Um, so what were we hoping to learn with this research? Uh, well, we identified a few questions. Um, firstly, can serious games contribute to, the tra to training for local humanitarian aid workers? And secondly, what were the potential barriers humanitarians may face to engagement with serious games as learning tools? In particular, we were curious about um, what type of technical barriers might exist. And finally, um, we want to know what are the practical requirements necessary to roll out mobile or tabletop serious games to learners working in emergency settings? Um, Tom, if you could pass us to the next slide there. 
Uh, so how did we put this research together? Uh, in total, uh, I facilitated six interactive workshops, three each in Nairobi and Amman in January 2020, which certainly feels like a long time ago now. Um, each workshop was open to up to 15 participants. Um, given they were free workshops, we sometimes had a full complement, sometimes had fewer, sometimes had too many. Uh, it was hard to say who was going to show up. Um, the workshops featured both tabletop and digital games um, in a mixture of genres and participants were surveyed before, during, and after the workshops to get a longitudinal look at participants' learning. Uh, participants were observed throughout and debriefing sessions were recorded to serve as data as well. Um, next slide, please. So before we get too deeply into the findings, I'd like to talk a little bit about what makes serious games tick. And this might be a, a bit of review for some of you, but I think it's useful to ensure that we're all on the same page. So firstly, what are serious games? Well, I would argue that serious games are tools which reproduce systems and experiences for participants to observe, take part in, experiment with, and feel. Uh, they certainly don't have to be fun, and this is especially the case in the humanitarian context. Instead, they're tools which produce meaning. Uh, that could be a model of a logistic system or a representation of a person's experience. Um, and when situated among other forms of learning, that meaning can then be ordered into a lesson. Um, now, we, don't have, we have a short time today, so I don't want to dive too deeply into theory backing up serious games, but I hope we can all agree that theory exists on the subject and does support the use of games and learning. Um, we as a community are not just making this up because it sounds cool. Um, experiential learning theory in particular claims that people learn best from direct experience, active participation, and visible feedback on the consequences of their actions. Serious games give all of these things. Um, serious games have also been found to be particularly effective in promoting skill acquisition, improving knowledge retention, uh, changing attitudes, supporting understanding of new concepts and ideas, shaping behavior, uh, improving problem solving, things like that. Now, these are all learning outcomes which we struggle with in lecture-based humanitarian training programs, and they're sorely needed. Uh, I also would say that serious games, if implemented well, can give us a safe environment in which to experiment and to fail. Um, and then to go on and analyze why our simulated innovations succeeded or failed. Um, let's pop to the next slide there. And we can start talking about what we uh, learned from this research. So first, uh, firstly, and most basically, we verified that it is possible to teach humanitarian lessons with serious games. Now, it's a simple point, but it's important. Um, participants overwhelmingly reported the learning from the exercises and were able to successfully identify learning outcomes of various learning games. They remembered those lessons and reported behavioral change up to 45 days after the workshop. Um, notably, almost 85% of participants felt that learning games were more effective than PowerPoint slides or lectures, um, and participants were excited to apply games to their learning, suggesting that educational games are a motivational tool for learning. Um, could we go to the next slide? So one common concern with the implementation of learning games is the assumption that they're not universally accessible. Um, there's an idea of game literacy, you know, the games come with an expectation of pre-learned skills, how common gaming systems work. Now we found that while this could play a role in games designed with accessibility in mind, when coupled with good intro, a good introduction and a facilitator or a digital system to coach participants through the game, this could easily be mitigated. Um, it was not as serious a factor in learning as we expect. Uh, we were also very curious to know if the accessibility of learning games was gendered, um, you know, it's quite well known that in casual games globally, you see a strong gender slant towards men in gaming communities. Um, and we found very little evidence that men were more engaged in the, in the games, sorry, no evidence that men were more engaged uh, in games than women. Um, and instead, men and women engaged equally and learned equally from the exercise. Uh, next slide. So in our workshops, immediately after taking part in learning games, participants reported their initial responses to exercises via surveys. Uh, we then participated in a group debriefing, after which participants recorded their responses to exercises a second time. Now, I can't emphasize this enough. Every single participant in the workshops, 100%, reported that a structured debrief was important to their learning process. This makes sense. Games actualize lessons. A game provides participants with a series of experiences, feelings, and thoughts. And a debriefing helps organize those impressions into lessons, linking experiences to previous training. Uh, debriefings also allow participants to share their own experiences with others and contrast experiences with what others observe. So this relates to another point, that learning games should not be considered standalone magical learning solutions, but must be applied in context alongside other traditional learning tools. 
whether that be face-to-face -face trainings or online e-learning courses. Um, if we pop to the next slide. So there were also some serious barriers to learning with serious games, which we observed during the workshops. Um, firstly, language was a key determinant in both learning from and engaging with the game. Uh, almost all the games that we sourced were delivered in English, and participants who were less fluent in English were at a very significant disadvantage. Uh, one way of looking at a learning game is a series of instructions and rules, and often these instructions are quite implicated, or, sorry, are quite intricate and complicated. Uh, if somebody misunderstands just a few of these instructions, they can end up very confused and disengaged, or even learn the wrong lesson. Um, and this can be as simple as misunderstanding a single verb or noun. It can be very difficult for a facilitator to check in with every participant during the course of a learning game. So the takeaway here is that whenever possible, learning games should be translated into the first languages of participants. Um, and otherwise, the provision should be made to check in and support with people who struggle to understand the game system or the content. So having multiple facilitators is almost a necessity. Uh, and this was true for both digital and tabletop games. Secondly, we did find that age was a minor determinant in engagement and learning. There was a very slight tendency for younger people to get more out of the gaming sessions, but it was very slight. There were plenty of older people who found the sessions both useful and engaging. Uh, next slide, please. So another very serious challenge or category of challenges was uh, technical issues. Now, even spending considerable time beforehand on attempts to mitigate technical challenges, we had a wide range of difficulties, incompatible devices, out-of-date operating systems, slow internet, etc. Uh, not everybody is going to have a state-of-the-art smartphone or a 4G internet connection, and while this is probably obvious for us, it might not be so obvious to tech teams who are designing the product. Um, as, a humanitarian, oh, sorry, as humanitarian subject matter experts on a games-based learning project, we would need to, un to understand these technical challenges well enough to communicate them clearly to our software developers in terms which they would understand. Now, for digital games, this absolutely must be considered in the design phase. And it's also important to note that despite our efforts, uh, we came across many unexpected digital problems. At one point, one of the games we were, we were using was actually updated uh, during our web during the workshops and all of the web links broke. Um, this caused all sorts of tech problems on the day. Participants were not able to engage with that game at all. Um, even when you think you've got all your bases covered, something unexpected can and probably will happen. Um, and it's much more difficult to make on the fly accommodations when the material is digital rather than physical. Which raises another important point. Digital problems are of course only present for digital games. A topic, oops, sorry, I tapped my, uh, I tapped my, uh, my notes here topic which we'll return to later in the webinar. Uh, could we get to the next slide there, Tom? Thank you, thank you. So one thing that we noticed while carrying out this research was the extreme importance of how designers represent various stakeholders in humanitarian crises, most importantly, of course, being the people who are actually impacted by the crisis. In almost all of our workshops, humanitarian workers expressed concern about how some of the games portrayed recipients of aid. Um, this could be inaccurate cultural generalizations or stereotypical depictions of people of color, or equally a lack of depictions of people with a range of intersectional identities. People noticed when quote unquote beneficiaries were represented simply as faceless units of need without any agency or impact on the game other than consumption. Um, humanitarian contexts are extremely sensitive and the humanitarian sector as a whole is constantly in a process of self-examination and adaptation to ensure that people are being supported with the dignity they respect and deserve. So here we are playing games about them. Well, how do we reconcile this? What does this mean for us as designers? Um, most importantly, I think we have a responsibility to the, to the people we are representing in our exercises. How we depict these people shapes how our learners conceptualize them. These trainees often go on uh, to situations with extremely imbalanced power relationships. This can be as simple as making sure that the images we use are, are respectful, uh, avoiding exploitative imagery, something that humanitarians in general are paying increasing attention to, but also being aware of more subtle violences like assumptions about skin color. Um, an example, a personal example, is a, a Syrian friend I have who, who uh, has very pale skin and people in the system would tell her, well, she doesn't look like a refugee. She actually would say, well, she believed that she received special treatment because of the status. We have to think about these kinds of things. Are we reinforcing those sorts of stereotypes or, or using our learning games? Are we, sorry, or by using our learning games, let me say that again, or are we using our learning games as opportunities to work against those stereotypes? Um, you know, I have my Derby House Principles pin on as well. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's 
we have to keep in mind that, that this means more than putting the logo on the website or tweeting in support. Um, and I think it also goes beyond the gender um, and background of, of game designers. We need to be thinking constantly about the content of the games themselves. Um, and as far as possible, we should avoid depict, depicting recipients of aid or any civilians really as simply a problem in need of solving or a random unpredictable force of nature. Uh, games are, are great tools for communicating and sharing perspective. Um, and wherever possible, we should be giving our participants an opportunity to see things from the point of view of those who are impacted by their actions, even if it's only for five minutes. Um, we can pop to the next slide. And I think this feeds into a broader point. For those of you who are familiar with Rex's presentations, this will be a familiar refrain, but we really must be careful that our enthusiasm for learning games does not lead us to work counter to our greater purposes. Um, in humanitarian settings, this is doubly so. We're training people who will have a great deal of power over others in the future. Participants need to know when abstractions are being used uh, and where they might deviate from reality. We need to be exceptionally careful that we are teaching people accurately and responsibly rather than feeding, seeding them with false assumptions or worse prejudices. And sometimes this might mean gently pushing back against our sponsors to depict systems accurately and honestly, including highlights where we as humanitarians make mistakes. That's something that most humanitarian agencies still struggle with. Uh, and we must ensure that we include respectful, dignified representation of people as active agents in crises. I think the games, with their power to change minds, present an interesting opportunity for some cautious and thoughtful advocacy, even activism, if we are deliberate in the choices that we make. Uh, we can pop to the next slide. So in this section of the presentation, uh, we're going to talk in broad strokes about the design of learning games. And again, we're not aiming to teach you everything there is to know about game design. Um, you know, even a general introduction to game design is, of course, a subject of an entire university course. But we'll try and arm you with at least a general idea of what a humanitarian worker um, would need to know in order to communicate with their team and arrive at a final product uh, that achieves their goals. So the first thing I'd like to talk about in very broad strokes is uh, some various structures of games. Obviously, there are lots of different kinds of games and different types of games are good for teaching different things. Now, the first and simplest distinction between learning games is the medium they take place in. And in this research, we simply broke that down into digital games and tabletop learning games. Digital games run on a computer or a smartphone or a tablet, might be a dedicated piece of software or something that runs over a combination of office tools, such as Zoom email and a shared drive like Google Drive or something. Tabletop games take place in the classroom, maybe with physical components like a board game, or they could be more like a role play. Tabletop games are faster to design and revise and can be corrected on the fly by an experienced facilitator, yes, um, but they are harder to distribute and facilitate. They often require, or they, they do require, assembling a group of people into one room, which of course is a bit of a problem these days, um, and they usually require a bit more time to learn. You're going to want a facilitator on hand to introduce the rules quickly um, and to help people with an inexact understanding of the rules to interact with the game system. Now, because of this, I would argue that tabletop games are better for immersive one-time experiences that focus on social interaction and complex problems. Digital games, on the other hand, are harder to design well, are more expensive to produce and revise, but they are easier to distribute once they're complete, and they require less, they may require less facilitation. Um, digital games can more easily be played repeatedly on demand and when convenient. They're best for shorter, simpler lessons that benefit from repetition. Now, they're harder to troubleshoot uh, and develop, development and revision often requires back and forth between a tech team and subject matter experts. Digital games, of course, require technol technological infrastructure to run, and when things go wrong, it's very hard to fix them once an exercise has begun. Now, a clear outcome of this research was also that participants prefer tabletop games over digital games, but I would like to say my personal belief is that digital learning games are, are really in their infancy in the humanitarian sphere and that we have a tendency to underestimate the complexity of building a good digital game, which results in subpar digital learning games. Now, tabletop games, yeah, they're faster, easier to workshop and iterate um, and require smaller teams to develop. And I think the result has been that they have come along further and more quickly. Um, and uh, when things go wrong in a tabletop game, if something happens the designer doesn't anticipate, a facilitator can, of course, adapt the tabletop game on the fly to exert at least some control on the system um, and ensure that learning outcomes are met, which just isn't possible in most digital games. But I would say there's no reason why digital games can't be as useful as tabletop games. Um, but I think we would have to be conscious of what digital games do best and what they do less well, and then design deliberately according to those opportunities and limitations. Um, 
Because of all this, when developing a digital learning game, we suggest that uh, starting with the table, or so we, su we suggest starting with the tabletop version of the new prototype. This will allow you to quickly iterate, make adjustments, perfect systems before handing over to software developers. Um, and it also has the added bonus of leaving the physical tabletop version of your game available for circumstances where technological infrastructure is unreliable or not present, which is common in humanitarian contexts. I would strongly suggest that tabletop games for humanitarian purposes be designed so they can be printed off an office printer and assembled with a minimum of work. Um, and I did want to touch very, very briefly on the importance of genre. Um, I think that this is an experienced audience. We probably don't have to go to, into it in too much detail. Um, but one of the clear findings of our work was that you do have to be very careful um, to ensure that the genre of your learning game is chosen to mirror the type of learning or experience you want participants to leave with. Um, and conversely, you want to avoid at all costs a game which is this, in which the structure does not mirror the learning goals. It just confuses and misleading, misleads your participants. Um, so this was a very quick overview, um, and we can talk a little bit more in the Q&A. Uh, again, I'll encourage you to take a look at the report, but uh, for the moment, I'm going to hand over to Tom. There we go. Just making sure I am unmuted. Uh, again, if there are any questions, please pop them uh, into the chat. Um, just reflecting on uh, what Matt has just, uh, has just discussed, a lot of the reason for the research that we did for Save the Children UK is because they are looking at expanding their particular, uh, their particular educational system and how they go about things. And they really needed to determine how digital compares to tabletop, is it any good? I uh, was very happy to see that a lot of the comparisons they were making were to Aftershock. Uh, so it's always nice to hear somebody uh, discussing your uh, a, 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 a game that has your name on the box uh, and holding it up as a, as a standard they're comparing things to. And again, it brings us to the next point that I'm going to bring up as we get into best practices and what we counsel to them is really needing to answer the question whether you need a game or you just really, really want one because there is absolutely zero evidence and the research we did bears it out that games are necessarily any better than a fabulous lecturer, let's say. Certainly they provide something different and different possibilities, but too many pe people do not ask the question and they just want the shiny new thing because somebody wrote something about games and they said, oh, well, let's just make a game about it. Uh, being a game designer, uh, it might seem strange that I insist that people go back and ask themselves the question over and over again, do you really need a game? Uh, because fundamentally, at the end of the day, if they're not 100% satisfied, it reflects very poorly on the designer. And I would venture to say that a lot of the time they are looking for the magic bullet that a game is not, as, uh, as, uh, as Matt was, uh, was alluding to. As part of that, is also questioning whether or not a game is the absolute best way to deliver the training. Certainly if one is testing uh, as a game that's being developed by Matt and I right now, field work, and we want to put people through the stresses before they get into a field, a game or simulation type environment is seems to be a terrific way to go. But the question must be asked over and over and over again to uh, to make sure this is something that we really wanted to emphasize to save the children uh, uk in particular and, and and to the wider audience as as a whole and certainly coming out of this uh, as they were discussing the potential for the games that they were looking at and the contracts that uh, that they were putting in place with the uh, uh, the gaming companies that were going to be developing their work, that one must absolutely go through the crawl, walk, run process in terms of approaching any sort of game. No one is going to get it right at the very beginning, 100%. 
this is very much an iterative process. And I think uh, Yuna Wong discussed it in her, uh, in her talk about design thinking. If you get up and go whole hog with massive money investments without starting small, uh, disaster can very quickly ensue and it is the lucky ones who get it right the, uh, the first time. So always best to very much, very much uh, stay, stay small. And as budding designers who might be online listening to this, we always want to solve the world and create the world's greatest game. And frankly, you're better off reinventing tic-tac-toe than on the first shot trying to uh, create the new chess, uh, for example. One of the matters that came out with uh, from from the games, in particular, digital games, uh, which were not necessarily giving players agency. And in one case with one person who seemed to disengage with a tabletop game, where they seemed lost and did not feel that their particular action was having any effect whatsoever. Certainly in terms of engagement, that the player must absolutely have agency or it's not a game. Uh, for all intents and purposes, it is a lecture. Uh, unless their choices actually make some kind of difference in the path that they are following, we're not talking about any sort of game. They're just walking through a, a predetermined scenario. So this is a, a very fundamental difference and any game design must reflect this. And then as we get into the discussion of player agency, this is really where uh, you know, we, we can talk about Bloom's taxonomy in terms of, you know, there's the, the grand lie of you remember 10% of what you read, but if you teach others, you remember 100%, that's, those numbers are completely false with no basis in truth. But as a concept, it certainly, uh, it certainly delivers an idea. And with a game, we're aiming at that sweet spot where people can learn to apply the things that they are learning and get into an analysis as things change and then a social discussion with other team players that, that are involved in this demo mode and so we can see how there can be tremendous benefit but once again reflecting back on the falsehood that is the the way that bloom's taxonomy is set up if you have a fabulous lecturer you can achieve much of the the rest of those goals without having to go a game route. So again, reflecting back from the beginning, do you need a game? Do you want a game? Is a game the absolute best way? If so, fantastic, but there are always other options. And as Matt was saying, a game is a tool. It is a tool that is part of the toolkit, just as any individual game for analysis might be just a tool in the, in the analytic kit. It is not the be all end all magic solution. Something that was also very apparent, especially with the uh, the non game players in terms of the the anecdotal commentary that they were giving is that with digital games in particular, the ones that we chose for the uh, for for the for the sessions as compared to the tabletop games, which had very clearly defined objectives and a facilitator there to back those up in a direct sense, that unless learning objectives are very clearly defined, the student or participant can get lost and not know what they're supposed to be learning, which is certainly something of, of tremendous value because then A, they might be learning the wrong thing, and again, this comes back to the design of do no harm. And it is so fundamentally important, especially in the digital realm, because in the digital realm, once you've published, the game no longer belongs to you. At the very least, in a tabletop game or a facilitated digital game, when the game is published and you are running through it with participants, you have that opportunity to redirect and be able to walk things back, push things a certain way because of the way they work. 
And again, with Aftershock, that's something that works tremendously well because as students are participating and they're wondering what they should do, you can have teaching moments. In Matt's game, uh, The Day My Life Rose, uh, dealing with uh, displaced persons, you have those opportunities. And unless you really can build that into your digital game as learning moments uh, or thought bubbles as to the, have you thought of this? It is very easy for someone to get off track and become lost. And then they've lost what the point of the game is. Now, it is very important to learn from others' mistakes. Now, I've put this in quotes because some things are not mistakes per se, but are purposeful choices that did not turn out as intended for whatever reason. But just as uh, one of the idioms of uh, game design is uh, copy, 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 plagiarize, uh, then do learn from others' mistakes. And in particular, when we start to talk about UI and UX, that's user interface and the user experience, both tabletop and, uh, and in the digital realm. Uh, there are certain things that we can very absolutely avoid. And we'll begin with talking about first impressions because first impressions matter. Uh, I originally discussed this at the First Connections North conference and I know it drove the point home because Rex later brought it up at a course that he was uh, teaching in Ottawa. At Connections North, much like Connections in the US, Connections UK, it is a serious war games conference. If we just take those words, Connection North, using the exact same letters, but just decide on what kind of font, we are completely and utterly changing the message that comes across. That first impression that one is going to make with a game is so fundamentally important. Certainly Connections North number one looks war gamey, maybe cargo. Number two, Connections North, could that be a little bit Star trek -y or NASA? Number three, Connections North could very easily be a dating conference. And number four, Connections North could be just about anything. So it's very important that when you're shaping things, that the impression that you are leaving your audience with, the impression that you are leaving that student with, reflects what it is that you're trying to teach. And it could be as simple as a font choice. This is where we get into cultural issues on what first impressions are. Color makes a massive difference. And again, in the tabletop realm, when you can very quickly adapt things, that's great in a digital realm where you would have to reprogram something entirely to change the UI, lots of forethought has to be put into these very particular uh, pieces of the puzzle and knowing one's audience. Another example of this is that Games for Change just uh, two weeks ago, a game called Flatten Island was, uh, was published. And, you know, we, we had a little bit of a laugh over this. Rex discussed it in, uh, in one of the, the talks that he was giving with uh, the people of global, global Affairs, I think it was. And a great little game that is all about flattening the curve for the COVID pandemic. The audience is teens and adults. However, it have very much has the look of a toddler game. Now, having played through it, the question and answer of this game makes lots of sense and you can see how it's put together, but it's very important to realize when putting together a game, that user experience shaped by the interface, by the look, is going to drastically affect what someone's impression is gonna be of this. And this might be a hard sell for someone who is not open to the game design behind the look. And I think many people would look at this and dismiss it as a kid's game, as opposed to what is fundamentally a quite serious, good informational representation of flattening the COVID curve. Also in discussing with uh, Save the Children UK, 
bigger is not always better. This is just a screenshot of uh, one of the Civilization games by Sid Meier. Beautiful, fantastic, huge, not realistic whatsoever, but it models economics and trade and warfare all across the board. But sometimes when a game is too big, then it can lose its sense. If it's a commercial game for fun entertainment game, all right, not bad. If it's a learning game in particular, then that largesse, if you will, the, the, the extent of the game can be overwhelming. And unless people are able to narrow in and narrow a focus, they can get very lost in their learning objectives. Also very important that we stress with them and we stress ourselves in developing things, expensive and shiny doesn't guarantee success. Urban Sim is a fabulous game. However, largely, it is not used to the potential that it could have. Why is that? Who knows? But tremendous resources were put into developing this game that's a great game, but why? There's, there's a question there, whether it is about the audience, whether it is about senior level buy-in, whether it is about the having the infrastructure available on hand to be able to run this game at a moment's notice. We don't know why it is not the phenomenal success it should have been, but this is a cautionary tale. Something in that mix, some question was not answered. Further, when we talk about Cold's experiential learning cycle, and both in terms of the game design process and then the game process itself. And Matt reflected on this when he discussed the debrief. Debrief, 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 debrief has been shown to be absolutely fundamental to the learning process. And that is almost completely contrary to the way most people want a game run. Because far too often, people want a game run at the end of a course, and they want it to be the cherry on top of the Sunday, which almost defeats the purpose of having the game at all. Because if there is a magic bullet to the game, it is that realization and the discussion and the redirection of the debrief all along the way. And I would say, based on this research in particular, and then personal experience, that when running a game and games for education and very a series of games, that having pauses where you can have feedback come into that game in a train in a training capacity is absolutely fundamental and quite frankly as game designers we should be thinking about how to build these things into the into the game on a on a constant basis one of my biggest pet peeves in game design is people calling gamification or referring to gamification as creating a game out of something it is entirely something very different it bothers me to no end, but I would say about 50% of clients will, will get this confused. One can implement gamification without having a game at all because it is just, it is a motivation and feedback system. That being said, it is important that your game does utilize well those gamification principles in terms of feedback, keeping the user engaged, whether giving them experience or rewards, giving them achievement, particularly in a learning game where they're training and letting them ramp up and feel like they're accomplishing something and then continually challenging them with larger challenges along the way. When that is built into the system, then you get a true experiential trained learning effect that builds upon itself that not only internally the player or student will swell with pride quite frankly and it motivates them to keep on moving forward but then the results because of that engagement can be exceedingly strong exceedingly strong that we've seen 
through research and then and then through our own. And fundamentally, the discussion we had with uh, with Save the Children UK is quite frankly, if you're going to build a digital game, go paper first anyway. And we had a bit of this discussion at Connections North uh, this past uh, this past February. Uh, when we were discussing things and the idea of being able to, in any sort of design schema, design on paper first with post-its, go cheap, make the mistakes there in that iterative design process where you're building something, testing it. If it's a mistake, great, you're throwing away a post-it note as opposed to throwing away two weeks of programming. It is fundamental. Uh, that in this iterative design process, you're able to test and adjust on the fly. And that is something you just cannot do if you go straight to uh, straight to a computer. This is just a summary of uh, what it is that we have just discussed, as it has been rather short. I'm not going to go over reading all of these pieces uh, one by one, but instead, step forward to the paper itself. Uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, you have the cover page of the, uh, of the research paper and the QR code that is there will take you directly to the PDF on Paxins. Otherwise, at the bottom of the screen, you have the actual address to get there. I'd invite you all to either use your cameras uh, or screenshot this page. It'll certainly be available uh, later on uh, via the YouTube. But if you wish to do that, then you'll be able to get to the, uh, to the research right away. And following this, we can now step on to our Q&A. So Matt, I'm sure everybody would like to hear your voice again and, uh, and, and see your office as we get through to the questions that have popped up. Uh, I believe Grant, you were, you were tracking some of these. I don't know if there's some that we missed. Uh, yeah, well, so first off, I wanted to uh, thank everyone because I, it was something that uh, I knew very little, very little about. So I was, uh, really appreciate the, the time and effort you guys put in the report and, and then obviously for uh, presenting it to us. Um, so I, my, I, I, I had a question kind of right off the bat, which was, I um, was wondering if you found any relationship between the type of language used in the game. And I guess I'll expand that, whether that's maybe kind of uh, victim fo focused or uh, perpetrator focused and and uh, how well the players would engage with the game. Uh, Matt, you want to take that with the uh, the participants? Yeah, sure. I, I, I'm just trying to think of, of uh, so the first thing I should say is that the, the report did not look specifically at, um, at the way that language was used in the games. Um, so at that level, I mean, anything that I'm, I'm saying here, you know, take with a grain of salt because it's very, very anecdotal. Um, I, I think that it, it, I did not see so much of a skewing of, of people's responses based on, on language to that regard. It was, again, more about the way that people were described, right? Um, you know, pe people were very quick to cotton on to uh, you know, an example, we ran a narrative game, a uh, digital game where the, 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 the people who were being depicted were quite powerless. Um, you could make decisions, but the decisions didn't really have much impact on, on your, uh, your actions um, or, or how the, the narratives unfolded. Um, it seemed very you know, random to them, which I mean, it's frustrating in any game, but was very specifically seen as you know oh like this is a depiction of of uh, people in need um as having no no power or no agency right things are just happening to them and whatever they try and do doesn't it doesn't really matter um interestingly enough i i mean i, I in some of those games there was actually quite strong language um you know about um events that might happen or 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 uh, or things like that, but as long as they were they were tied to some sort of rationality, uh, people didn't get upset. I mean, there was one particular game, an interesting case study. Um, it was an action game, 
um, and it, it told quite a you know a sad story um, um, where a family is you know the protagonist is losing family members. Um, people weren't upset about the loss of the family members, but more the way that it was it was told. You know that um, that you're you're basically playing Mario, and then oh you know your your child has has been killed in a conflict. Well, that's very incongruous, and that that was really what upset people. Um, does that sort of answer the question? I think. Uh, yeah, I, hope I, yeah I, well, I, I certainly think so. And uh, I'll add to that a little bit because in the entertainment game community of late, there have been certain games that have, uh, that have come up that, that reflect certainly, you know, colonization of Africa, for example, that people then decide, well, we're not publishing or we're pulling it off or not advertising. And we have to differentiate certainly between you know what are certain cultural norms and the the ways that people feel about certain such uh, situations that one might be exploitation right versus a training game where while you want to be sensitive to your audience if you're delivering a game for save the children uk UNHCR, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, then you want, you will be exposing them to certain things that go wrong. Uh, and while you need to be certainly sensitive in terms of some language, you also don't want to be completely and utterly, well, either, you know, literally whitewash things or in a in a sense to to sanitize them too much because then it defeats the purpose of the uh, of, of the training and because it's a game it's too easy to dehumanize certain things uh, i'll reflect on aftershock and it goes beyond language per se in aftershock you're presented with a problem of persons who are in distress and who may die if you do not act quickly enough to save them and they're also represented by resource points. Students or participants might focus on the resource points. Oh, this is important, this is important, this is important. And then we have to remind them 6,000 people just died because you did not take care of that. So, you know, there's, there's a certain bit of, of play in there as well. And, you know, you don't want to sanitize that. And if it's something as horrible as ethnic cleansing, and it is part of the training, because you are training people to look out for atrocities, they have to be discussed. But it's, you know, and again, it comes back to knowing, knowing that audience fundamentally more than uh, more than anything. Got it. Thank you. And I, I know that that fed right into Sebastian had a question. I think you touched on it about how some cultural norms affect games. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head there. Um, uh, we have a question next from Mark who asked, uh, how best do you, um, you do paper prototyping uh, given the last few months with all the designers and developers being completely remote? Uh, I'll jump on this and then uh, Matt, you can add on maybe uh, at the end. There are so many available tools, uh, whether it is Google Slides, sharing things through Microsoft Office, where you can very quickly put together your images uh, and represent it with pieces. There are tools like Tabletop Simulator that you can, that you can put together, other commercial play tabletop uh, environments like Roll20 where you can put things together that there's no lack of ways to be able to uh, to test out your game. Uh, it could be as simple as Zoom and using Google Slides to move things around. And I know for a fact that it's been used professionally for matrix gaming at, uh, at a military level. So there are, and Google is free. Uh, there, there are free tools to, uh, to be able to, to go and do this. Now, the live face-to-face -face doesn't necessarily happen certainly uh, as easily. That does not prevent you from, uh, with my 11-year-old uh, uh, stepson, 
uh, we we've been creating games and it's as easy as post-it notes sharpie and uh, and bits of cardboard to to go around and when you think about it uh, what is a post-it note but a square graphic with text written on it that you can easily reproduce in powerpoint or google slides so i would say that is very much the the easiest way to go and because something like google slides or powerpoint you can be multiple persons viewing it at the same time uh, as long as you've got an internet connection you you can you can prototype yeah i think i think tom covered a lot of uh what i would, would have said as well um th there's a lot of very cool systems that are out there i think that one of the things that you know, we didn't really touch on so much in this presentation, but um, has kind of been becoming clear to a lot of us uh, as we struggle to deal with this digital world that we're finding ourselves constrained to, is that there's a lot of kind of interesting gray areas um, between, you know, a digital app or something like that and a, and a paper prototype or a paper game. Um, and looking at interesting ways that you can say, run a game through uh you know zoom and and google spreadsheets you know like a shared spreadsheet or something like that um can be very interesting i've, I've participated in some really really interesting you know 50 person exercises that basically just took place over um over uh, uh, uh discord um which is not the most professional tool but it's very flexible um mm. And then, uh, da, 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 what else did we use? Yeah, spreadsheets and roll twenty and things like that. I mean, you can you can really build some interesting things if you if you just kind of step out of the box and, and, and look at that gray space in between, which I think will go on to influence us um, long after this is over. I think. Really. Great, thank you. Um, I know we had a, a couple questions next about um, about the methodology, and uh, Brant had asked. Uh, what sort of general game literacy, if any, did the players uh, come in with? It, it varied a lot. It was a very, very wide range. Um, so, you know, again, it's in both Jordan and Kenya, you, you do have, a, you know, almost everybody's got a smartphone these days. They are playing games on those devices. Um, you know, I mean, I remember in Jordan even, you know, you'd have these, uh, uh, places where you could go and play play PlayStation for an hour for a few bucks, you know, and you, they just have them, they you rent them out like they're the kiosks, right? Um, that being said, though, a lot of people that came in had no game experience uh, or very, very little. Um, so I, I really, I mean, it, it was a very, very wide range. Um, I, I think, though, that there is a certain, um, like, a, for example, card games are, are, are kind of globally known. You know, these aren't things that are, are people have never seen before. And, and um, yeah, it, 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 uh, it uh, I mean, so, some people learned faster than others. But I was really impressed actually with how, how quickly everybody learned uh, complicated games like Aftershock or The Day My Life Rose. Um, <laughs> the first five minutes they look at you like, what? Um, but by the end of it, everyone of course is just yelling at each other and, uh, and, uh, and, and trying to, <laughs> trying to come to some sort of agreement. Yeah, I, th I think they certainly had the advantage as well that Matt, Matt was present for those uh, for, for those for those sessions, and it goes to it goes to show how important a facilitator, you know, a certainly an accessible facilitator can be. I will say facilitator slash coach slash um, teacher. Uh, where you can smooth a lot of things over because certainly, you know, Aftershock can be run without a facilitator who's done it many times, but it certainly brings the complexity up a level. Uh, if you have backup there for digital games that do not have tutorial prompts, then there's a certain comfort level and you can ease into things. And I think that makes up a big, uh, a big chunk of the success that they were able to have because I can just imagine if they were just handed these games and told to play these without any sort of context, then you will, I think we would have had a quite different 
set of results. Again, reflecting back on the debrief, reflecting on you know Matt as a facilitator and professor, professional facilitators in, uh, in in general to be able to to smooth things over in that in that regard as a training game, right? And then keeping in mind this is a for this is a training game, a little bit different from analytic games. Uh, but certainly, uh, I think that uh, had an effect. And only because Matt just mentioned uh, card games uh, and there was the discussion about culture that uh, you have to think about, once again, knowing who your audience is because some gaming implements are taboo in some cultures for religious or other reasons. And it is not a small feat. And this is part of the discussion that Matt and I had as we were putting together the methodology and what games are we choosing and who is this going to be a problem because depending on who you get, uh, then it might be the sort of thing where it just cannot be touched upon. And again, coming back to you got to know the audience for this game uh, fundamentally. It's a, it's a good point. It, it, um, there's a, a couple questions I'm going to skip ahead to that, that kind of touch on that. Um, so I'll just launch a, a couple of them at you. But Merle had asked uh, in this set of engagements, what did you learn about your own individual prejudices or, or stereotypes? Um, and how might you kind of try to avoid or address them next time? Uh, and and Daryl had, had also asked um, uh, any kind of cross-cultural issues that you had to overcome. And, uh, you know, did you make an effort to maybe adapt custom, customs that you were going to be encountering in the creation of your games? Um, so I apologize. I kind of just threw a whole bunch of questions at you there. That's, uh, you know, I think one of the things that we, I would say anyway, for me was um, coming into it, I really was not sure how people would pick stuff up. I mean, they, you know, that's part of what the research was about is that uh, everyone might just stare at you like, do you expect me to do what? Um, and uh, that was entirely misplaced, really. Um, that people were really, really, again, like we said, whether they had a lot of experience or very little, they were very excited to get involved. Um, and, and that, you know, for example, I was, I was, so the, the, the Day My Life Froze um, is, a, is a game that I have about uh, urban refugee response. Um, and it's fictionalized, but it's pretty clearly based uh, on, on Jordan. And I mean, you know, I, I'm open with the fact, when I'm facilitating the game and the workshop, I'm open you know, about the fact that I lived and worked in Jordan for a long time, so it doesn't take a genius to put together, okay, well, this is where he's, he's getting these, these, uh, these things from. And, and I was very curious about, you know, how will people respond to me running this game? Uh, in Jordan, um, uh, and am I being sensitive enough and thoughtful enough? And have I, you know, inadvertently been offensive at some point? I mean, probably I was, and nobody, everyone was just too polite to point it out. But um, yeah, and again, I, I, I really, uh, people were not, they, they, they didn't struggle with it. They weren't upset by things. I mean, we even had a few Syrian people in the, the, the workshops, and they, they weren't you know, upset um, and actually said, yeah, you know, I appreciate it when you're actually uh, 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 representing things in an accurate sort of way. Um, yeah, I mean, and another thing was we did, uh, honestly, we did come to it expecting that there would be um, a gender divide. Um, and there, there was not, really, there was not, which was fantastic. In a lot of cases, actually, it was kind of neat um, seeing, um, seeing, uh, how, how would you say it? I think the, 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 the game provided a space, I think, for some women to really, uh, um, you know, exercise a, a degree of, of, uh, of, of power in a lot of ways that, you know, might have been more difficult to achieve in an office or something like that, right? So taking on higher roles and, and really like stepping up to, 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 to engage with, with uh, you know, problems that maybe they, they had less opportunity to deal with. And again, this is, I, I'm not trying to say I'm making generalizations, um, but uh, it, was, it was neat to see actually that the game seemed to be, if anything, I think that, that women liked the game more than men, um, or the games rather more than men in, in a lot of, of uh, the workshops. Um, with respect to, to, to 
culture. I mean, I'm trying to think of a few. The, the one that stands out in my mind was actually one specific person um, who is a Syrian woman who um, had, she, there, there was a game that was, was telling the story of a, a Syrian family, uh, you know, by a text basically, uh, trying to travel irregularly to Europe, right? So um, the, the, you as the, the, the actor was the, the husband um, and you were texting your wife who was making this dangerous trip. And she was really just like, this isn't what Syrian people are like. You know, it's just not how yeah. Syrian people behave. Or maybe, yeah, this is a minority of Syrian people behave this way, but to, to sort of cast this as how most Syrians are, it's just incorrect. Um, and I was really surprised by it. I mean, I, I had played the game and loved it. Um, <laughs> so shows what I know. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's the, the real standout that, uh, that comes to my mind. Okay, well, uh, thank you for that. Um, we have uh, just a couple more questions on the, on the methodology and then kind of shifts to um, more general questions about game design. Um, Robert, I'm apologize, I'm probably mispronouncing your last name, Domain, uh, asked if, if you could uh, tell us more about the games that were actually used in the workshops and kind of an add on, um, Sebastian had asked maybe which ones were particularly difficult to run. Well, certainly for the tabletop games, we used Aftershock and uh, Matt's uh, The Day My Life Rose, and quite simply because we are certainly the most familiar with them, being <laughs> being so intimately uh, in involved with them, so there was no question about that. But it's funny because on the digital side, le leading up to this, and uh, Matt, Matt, please unmute yourself and, uh, and, and jump straight in. You know, we had a whole discussion about what to use because there aren't that many good games with a humanitarian bent that make a lot of sense uh, in the general in the general sphere of games that are uh, that are out there, despite what some of them may be called, uh, you know. And there was one in particular put out by uh, a uh, a, sp a particular agency talking about children being able to find their voice and it was just a a platformer uh, skateboarding game where kids are picking up megaphones and we thought we had high hopes looking at this saying oh this is a great organization and then happened upon this and thinking how the hell does this give anybody any sort of voice with a kid grinding across you know a sidewalk and picking up these megaphones that are basically mario brothers uh, so Matt, uh, you know, certainly you have the direct experience with what the, uh, the participants uh, viewed face to face. Yeah, and, I mean, you, you will have noticed we're a lot, um, a, a lot uh, quicker to talk about the tabletop games because we know that the designers won't get offended um, if we <laughs> denigrate them. <laughs> which um, which is not the case with the digital games, right? We didn't design the digital games. We, we did have quite a bit of trouble finding games that, that were appropriate, um, partly because of selection. Um, there just aren't that many publicly available humanitarian learning games. Um, we also were, were I mean, we, we made the decision um, not to, to use any paid products. Um, and this was just simply because people were using their own laptops and, and, and cell phones and the idea of trying to get everybody access to, to, to something that they had to pay for would have just been, I, I, even, if, even if we had decided to spend the budget on it, the idea of trying to get these things to people just seemed like a nightmare. Um, so that was limiting. Um, we, we also found that, I mean, it was, it was shocking how many games you would find that were pretty good but maybe had a you know a, an inadvertently very offensive uh title you know that sort of puts people down or, or denigrates the people that are that are engaged and there was a certain level of okay well you know we have to have a few games that are less good in here um to, to get an interesting spread but also uh we don't want to to just outright you know offend people and turn them off in the first five minutes. <laughs> so, so there was a bit of delicacy there. Um, I would say that some of the very, very good games that we, that we included were, um, 
were um, uh, by far the best is called Mission Zobia. Yeah, I mean, again, you can look these up in the report, but um, it's a fantastic, fantastic exercise. Um, too much text, which really confused people who didn't speak really good English, but what was really, really, it shows what digital games can do. Um, um, another one that was that was interesting was uh, again this 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 the story about the Syrian family. Uh, it's called "Bury Me, My Love," um, which the paid version is very good. Unfortunately, the free version is a little bit less good, but and that was what we had to use. Um, but yeah, um, we also I'm recalling in the report that not only do we have a list of the games that we included, but uh, games that we did not include. Um, so if you're looking for a, a smorgasbord of interesting humanitarian games, that's a great place to go. Great. Well, I will have to shut down my plans for skateboarding megaphone game. Um, <laughs> uh, we, we had a, a couple of questions coming up on, on the actual design uh, and, and branding of games. So uh, Evan D'Alessandro asks, uh, what sort of branding do you view as most important for physical game components? And do you try and shy away from being too bright colored and kind of board gamey just so that people can view it more seriously? Oh boy, now, now, now you're really talking my language. I, I went back to school to get my graphic design degree to, because I got into gaming and then wanted more games. Uh, it, it comes down to, especially for serious games, knowing the audience. And, you know, so much of design is the research and knowing who it is these courses are going to and the more widespread the audience then the more let's say the more neutral you have to be a little bit um but in terms of design choices uh and i'm just looking over here at my other screen just to reread your question you try to sh shy away from being bright colored and board gamey Again, depends on who you're trying to teach. At a professional military level, you would like things to have a certain military appeal to them. Uh, if you're designing a serious game for special education, then you might want and or need uh, very bright colors for engagement. Um, as we're talking about color, also important to think that if this is widespread, you have to deal with people who are colorblind. And so making sure, especially for a training game, that things are not solely based on color, that there's some other way to, uh, to differentiate between, uh, between certain things. It's not always possible, but uh, certainly it is an ideal goal, but this comes down to the design choices you make because you can make the perfect game that costs $2 million that no one is ever gonna pay for, or, have to make certain sacrifices uh, along the way. The more real the situation, the more real you want it to look and feel and be less gamey in those terms. But again, there are certain choices that have to take place because if this is an hour that is designed to run in 45 minutes, well, you're probably going to need some kind of board with some kind of track that might have a gamey type mechanism to it, uh, just for knowing where it is that you are, but you can offset that with realistic imagery. So there are different ways to, to play with, uh, with that in particular. And in certain cases, it almost doesn't matter. And I'm going to throw it to Matt for a second with his game, The Day My Life Rose, and representing people, and particularly one story you told me about someone taking a taxi and what represents that person, and people get emotionally involved with well, an inanimate object, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say the same. So I, you know, uh, I like to say that oh, you know, you really don't need the the, the beautiful art and everything like that. Um, but it's really just because I don't have that much design skills, so all my designs are quite sparse um, by uh, by by sheer necessity. Um, I, I would say that, I mean, I, I don't think that having a, a artsy or beautifully laid out, uh, you know, board gamey looking thing is going to, to necessarily um, negatively impact uh, what people are doing, uh, just as Tom said. Um, and, and I mean, I, the story that Tom is talking about is um, in, in 
this exercise, the day of my life throws this, this uh, uh, simulation game about urban refugee response. Um, your family is represented by sand timers, right? So they go off and do actions. Um, you put them down and then the sand runs through them and the sand is done running through. Uh, it's finished. Uh, you, you know, they've completed their, their work or they've gone to go buy bread or whatever. Um, and, oh, I'm getting some feedback there. Yeah, it wasn't you, Matt. Somebody uh, had unmuted themselves inadvertently. There we go. Um, and uh, and uh, specifically, some of the sand timers are, are, are children, right? They, they run a little bit slower. It takes them longer. You can send them to go do work. You know, you have to make this difficult decision. Am I going to send my child to work? Well, um, you know, I mean, maybe I need the money and I have to do that. Um, in that game, there is one potential path you may go down where you have the opportunity to send a child um, on a risky journey to be smuggled to Europe. And, um, and, and the number of times I've had people look at me and be like, no, this is my child. And they clutch their sand timer to their chest and go, oh, I would never give away my child. Are you kidding? Um, it, it really, I mean, the first time it happened, it shocked me. And now, and now it's just, you realize that it, it, you know, it does not have to be realistic. It doesn't have to be, um, um, even shaped like a person uh, for people to, you know, to, to develop some kind of bond with them as long as they're, they're creating some meaning around the subject through the course of, of uh, you know, an hour or two. Um, I would say though that, I mean, you do want it to look professional, uh, however you end up doing that, right? Um, even in my, my, you know, very weak design uh, uh, skills, I, I, I strive to make it look clean and, 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 and simple and, and sharp and bold and things like that, um, as opposed to cartoony or silly or, or, or uninteresting um, or, you know, ugly or anything. But I don't know. I could, I could go on, but I think I've rambled enough about mm -hmm. that one. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll just jump in with the, you know, the, all, the counterpoint to that, right, is what do you try to avoid? What do you try to exploit? Anybody who's ever had to go to the bathroom immediately knows how to identify what the bathroom symbol looks like. So you can exploit things like that, right? And as so long as you give visual cues to allow people to identify with something, uh, then it can be believable. And you can also exploit the, if you need somebody to care about something, make it within a reasonable realm cute, and then people will automatically be, be drawn to it. You put a kitten with big eyes on it, chances are 75% of the people are going to want to save that kitten, right, in, in, in those terms. And, and it is a reflection of, of how you want people to respond to the game. Again, I would use this in a training game, not in an analytic game, right, because you're trying to elicit a response and try to direct people and test them. Uh, but just as knowing the audience, knowing the audience, what it is that they will accept and knowing what it is that you're trying to test for and again, reflecting back on the very, very beginning, define your game. If you know you want a game, define what it is you're trying to teach, trying to solve, and then everything falls into place uh, right after that. Thank you. So that, so that kind of leads into a, a question that Daryl had, and I apologize, Scott, I skipped your question. I'm going to get to it right after. Um, but uh, Daryl asked, for the, for the games that you create and test through prototyping, do you have or use some kind of criteria to validate the, the game's playability? Uh, I, I just UI UX really experience. Yeah, go ahead, Matt. Oh, I was just going to quickly say, I wish. Um, maybe Tom has a better answer than that. And Daryl, if you have something, please give it to us. I think this is one of the biggest problems with serious gaming uh, 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 research in general, right? Is that uh, you read a study and they say, ah, serious games or simulations suck at teaching people things. And you look at the simulation and you go, well, that was a real, like, yeah, that simulation sucks. Of course it didn't teach anybody anything. Um, if we had some kind of scale or way to analyze, you know, like this is a is this a well-designed product versus a poorly designed product um, or learning tool rather? Um, that would be fantastic. Anyway, I'm going to see to Tom. That's all I got to say. Yeah, uh, certainly in, uh, you know, the advantage of heading back and doing my graphic design degree is a lot of these, uh, a lot of these aspects. Uh, 
Now you'll see a lot more UI UX being described in terms of digital games, obviously, but they have, it's directly analogous to tabletop games and the way that they operate. And again, so much of UI and UX comes back to knowing the audience and knowing what it is that you're, uh, that you're that you're trying to say now within that then you know I, since you do the research you know there's reams and reams and reams on it uh you know from digital game from as far as you know where your thumb can reach uh which is just not an issue in terms of uh in terms of tabletop games in a direct sense uh per se but you know there, there are standards out there and then with tabletop a lot of it comes down to experience because where this has really been explored on the digital side uh on the tabletop side it's uh it's more anecdotal more experience based what exists and a lot of people will plagiarize from existing items uh in terms of tracks in terms of uh, in terms of setups in terms of uh, of whatever uh, but fundamentally, you know, again, so much comes that comes down to you have to know your audience. Uh, you know, without knowing that, particularly for a training game, uh, you can get quite lost. All right, thank you. I think so. We have uh, we're down to our last queued question. So I encourage anyone else who has questions, feel free to toss them in the chat. Um, but so this is from Scott, and he said that. Although serious games consistently generate interest and, and motivation, um, do you find them actually being more effective than the broad range of active learning strategies in terms of long-term cognitive learning? Um, or is it maybe just that they're more effective than traditional lectures? They are not, period. They are different. They are not. They are in absolutely no way, there is zero research that supports that they are any better for long-term cognitive learning. They are different and they can certainly test different things. Uh, what I think learning games do well is stress the participant and the student in a certain way and put them under a situation like that. But there is absolutely no evidence that a game in, as a teaching tool is any better than a really great lecturer or professor but what it is is different because it can provide those scenarios and stresses and forced decision points and i think that's where the experiential learning side of things uh, comes into play but zero absolutely zero zero evidence and if anybody tells you otherwise they are absolutely lying there is one report out there based on one person uh, saying that you learn better in a lecture in a, on a uh, uh, on a screen digitally than uh, than in a lecture. Um, and just as uh, Bloom's taxonomy is stated almost as fact, saying, "Well, you only remember 10% of what you read." All of that is absolute horse hockey there is no evidence whatsoever that it is any better that one is any better than the other but there are is different tools in the kit both are best when used in conjunction great thank you I, we actually had one question pop up uh during that um and so this is from evan d'alessandro uh, and i think this may pertain to your research or just kind of in um, in, in your career in general, is how do you manage someone um, explicitly disagreeing about how something works in the game based on um, probably some kind of real life similar situation that they've been in? Uh, for me, and this came up when uh, Matt was right next to me, uh, at HNPW, the Humanitarian Network Partnership Week, we were running Aftershock as demos. A fabulous experience because the moment we ran it, the people that we were running it for all of us became facilitators in the very next game. So it was, it was a great little dynamic. But we had some higher ups from uh, consultants working with the UN coming along and saying, "Well, 
that would just never happen. You know, with the very haughty uh, uh, attitude, and you know, and it really is a matter of explaining that you are yes, a hundred percent correct, but we're trying to compress a two-week scenario into two hours. Not everything can be a hundred percent realistic, and and I think approaching things in this way and framing things saying understand you're not the audience for this you're up here and we're looking at that year one student or the person who's fresh into uh, humanitarian aid to give them a reflection of what's what's going on or so that military has an idea of oh okay so that's the way the un will operate and what the clusters are all about uh so so long as you frame things in my experience, people have, you know, then drop their guard and are less haughty about it and say, okay, and then they, then they go with the flow. If you get that belligerent person, well, you, you're not going to please everybody all of the time. Um, I would say in running Aftershock for maybe two over the past five years or four years, where they really just, well, I couldn't be bothered with this. Uh, but most people will will certainly tend to uh, to get it. Matt. Yeah, I mean, I, I would entirely agree. I think um, obviously sometimes you you just find difficult people, and how do you ever deal with the really really difficult ones in the classroom? It's a, it's a challenge in a lot of ways. Um, but then what Tom is saying is is usually quite effective, right? You explain the learning objectives of the exercise. You say this is how we're we're, we're hitting those learning objectives. And also, I think, you know, it, it can become a very interesting learning moment when you say, okay, what wasn't in this game? You know, let's mm -hmm. talk as a group about what didn't get represented. Um, and then they get to feel good about themselves because they get to demonstrate their knowledge. But also, everyone else is saying, okay, yeah, this is an abstraction, right? This isn't real life. And here's some things that, that, that add to my knowledge as well. Um, so the, it, it can actually be an opportunity uh, if you're lucky, <laughs> depending on the person. Um, but I, I also agree with Tom, you know, I, I haven't, haven't been doing it as long as him, but I certainly have found very, very few people that just, um, that just disengage it and, and refuse to take part. Um, you know, I mean, sometimes it's, it can be as simple as saying something along the lines of, look, other people are learning and, and um, you know, I would really appreciate it if you don't undermine their learning, um, but hopefully it doesn't even get to that point. <laughs> it's a hard question, it really is difficult. Yeah, and, you know, and, and reflecting on what uh, what Matt just said is the, you know, again, it shows the importance of that debrief. Is anybody else getting a really weird noise? Um, oh, yeah, it, it was coming from your side, Matt. Yeah, it, it, was, it almost sounded like a ghost um, that, you know, really reflects the importance of the debrief because depending on who is participating in the learning game, they will have something to add to this and quite frankly as a designer we should be open to this hearing what it is they have to say because we're not inherently subject matter experts on everything we design for and 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 further beyond that it again reflects the knowing your audience the only reason that this came up is because we were giving open demos to anybody who would come along and here is a game that is set at a 101 level and we're asking a postdoc to play this as if they're a 101 level and they're getting a little haughty about it. So I, they would never do this. And I don't care what Médecins Sans Frontières says, this isn't what I what we would allow them to do and blah, blah, blah. And you know, and that sort of thing. And, and it's, it's very much is that, and again, especially in a training game, if you set your training level really low and your audience is expert, it's never going to succeed. So yeah, so much comes back to that, knowing who the audience is. All right, well, Matt and Tom, thank you so much. I, I think we're all out of questions. I'll maybe wait just a few seconds in case anyone's got some, uh, some, some stragglers, but, um, in the meantime, I just, uh, for everyone who's here, obviously you can find, um, I think it, there's, it's been linked in the chat, but uh, you can find the uh, actual report to the research on the um, code up on the screen. Thank you, thank you. Um, 
and uh, Matt and Tom both listed their contact information here. So um, I'd just like to big kind of Zoom round of applause uh, and, and thank you two for, for being here. Really appreciate the presentation uh, and uh, really actually want to thank everyone involved for the discussion after. Um, it was really helpful. Uh, and um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's all we got. Um, I don't know if you guys have any, any parting words, but uh, again, a, a big thank you. We really do appreciate you guys uh, doing this for us. I'll just like to say thank you, Brent, and uh, thank you, Sebastian, and the uh, Georgetown University uh, Wargamer Society for putting this series on because it's really been informative, entertaining, and great. And I will leave the last word to Matt. Yeah, I'm just going to say the same thing. Um, it's a fantastic series. Um, thanks to everyone who made it through the whole uh, exercise, the whole discussion. Um, and well, and I guess thanks to those who left earlier too, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> but um, no, and, and really don't hesitate to get in touch with either of us. I mean, we, we do this because we love it and uh, we like to hear about other people who, who feel the same way. So um, with that, yeah, uh, hope everyone has a good night. Uh, enjoy the hockey. <laughs> <laughs>